Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Open for Science. This is a talk that I gave before at Lero, so if people have seen it before. Sorry, it's the same slide set. But uh, yeah, it's Open for Science. So um, um, just a bit of background. So yeah, I'm Kevin Mormon. I work at NUI Galway in the Biomedical Engineering uh, Group. And I tend to work on software frameworks that allow for medical device design. So you, you can, see. can you see my cursor? Can somebody confirm that that's visible or not? Should I not use it? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, you yeah. can, yeah. Okay. okay, so this is a prosthetic socket framework, a face mask framework, and uh, an ins shoe insole framework, and a hip implant uh, framework in the, in, the, in the bottom. And uh, these would be ideally open source frameworks, so that they're actually the only the top right one, because I have a patent with MIT that I'm still affiliated with, um, is not open source. The other ones, you could fully run and reproduce all of these figures, and that's uh, what I'm trying to do with all of my uh, my science. Um, the build, these frameworks are all built with my open source toolbox Gibbon, which is a MATLAB toolbox to facilitate uh, geometry processing and meshing and, and computational analysis of these things. Okay, so that was my background, or here's a bit more background. I'm also a co-founder and edit, associate editor-in-chief of JUST, the Journal of Open Source Software. So if people have questions about that, let me know. Uh, I'm an academic editor for, for the Open Access Journal PLOS, I'm on the steering committee of the engineering archive. So that's an archive for hosting preprints and articles like that uh, freely available. So, so that's the green open access route for engineering articles. If you have questions about that, contact me as well. And then the Journal of Open Hardware. So that's a novel type of output that is of research that is increasingly recognized as a valid um, uh, science, the hardware behind the science. And then we started the Open Scholarship Community Galway with GMIT and NUI. Um, so that's that's new as well, and um, that's growing in Ireland. That more communities are starting to get together and talk about all aspects of open science. So maybe there's one in your area, and you can connect with them. And the Open Access Clinic, which is a, root, uh, a, web, a simple website that just shows you the, the steps to to making your research papers openly available. Okay, so I'm going to talk about open for science and talk about why do we need open science? Why is open science good for your career? That's a bit selfish, perhaps, but it, it is important to know that too, and how to be an open scientist. Uh, some notes, I am likely quite a bit behind on the latest developments. There's, it's going very rapidly. Um, so, oh, and I have to apologize if you hear a funny sound. We have a water system in this room that makes funny sounds, so sorry about that. Uh, anyway, for the purpose of this talk, open science equals open scholarship, because some people feel that as, say, someone working in the humanities, you might feel like that you're part of open science per se, but open scholarship is, to me, sort of the same thing. Um, when I say I'm behind, maybe you can talk to um, your librarian about very up-to-date aspect, or uh, consult, say, the SFI uh, or other funding agencies' open access policies, because they're rapidly evolving. So, and I offer a recommended approach with some recommended tools, but there are lots of other resources available, so have a look yourself, too. And I do comment on licenses for open access and open source, but I'm not a, a lawyer and I'm not an expert on them. So always study license carefully and the, and the implications, okay? So that's just a, a word of warning. So let's look at the definition of science, right? I just looked at Wikipedia. Science is from the Latin scientia, meaning knowledge. Uh, it's a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations. Okay, so that's, that'll do for us, builds and organizes knowledge and it has to be testable. So in other words, we generate some knowledge, and put it somewhere so that other people look at it. It's, it's knowledge for humanity, right? We should all be able to look at it. And uh, we should communicate and share that so that people have access to it. And because they have access, they can test it and reproduce it and verify that science. That should just be science. So let's see, are we doing a good job currently at that? So there are some nice videos here that I invite you to look at. I hear some background noise. Maybe people can mute their uh, microphones if you're not... Uh, uh, wanting to ask a question, but do feel free to interrupt me with the question if you want. Okay, uh, so the history of the model is that publishing scientific manuscripts is expensive, right? You wanted your article distributed widely, you send it to a journal, and that's um, a, a traditional process. And they would re manage the review process and the revisions and eventually accept uh, something that um, that is publishable. Now, the reviewing actually is fairly recent. In the 1970s, for instance, the, the Lancet and Nature started introducing and requiring peer review. So it's actually a recent invention in that sense, or recent. it has only recently been adopted by the big players as well. 
And they, so the journals handle typesetting and printing and distribution of your scientific work. So that, that could be costly, right? All this printing and typesetting and distribution. But what has changed about well, digitization? There's templates. The typesetting is nearly done, right? Your, your PDF actually looks quite pretty already. You, they force a template down your throat quite often. And, um, but, so it's digital now, it's no longer printing, so that cost is, is removed. It's actually very low cost and easy to host stuff online and to do the editing and typesetting as well, which is nearly done. But prices have increased rapidly. So what's going on? This is, this is odd. In fact, if you plot the journal unit cost, they've gone up by 260%, but inflation only about 70. So um, it's not due to inflation. The, the costs are just going up to make more money from this very lucrative business of um, publishing scientific papers. But the funny thing is the journals aren't producing the material, right? Like we write them as scientists. So they don't employ the people who write the papers. They don't employ the reviewers. And quite often, so I mentioned I'm all on these editorial boards. I don't get paid anything to be an editor for these journals. So quite often the editors aren't paid. So it doesn't make sense in terms of what science is about. It's about discovering new things and spreading that knowledge. And now there's this lucrative business and which seems to be the best thing that we can do or that they claim that this is the best way to distribute science and I claim that it's not. Um, also, it's not fair. So taxpayers, they pay the government. The government funds funding agencies, which then funds scientists. And then we throw that money at journals for it to be locked away and hidden so that no one, no one has access. That does not make sense. Those last steps don't make sense, especially that the taxpayer then doesn't have access to the final works. There are some websites that I cite here, Open Society Foundations and whoneedsaccess.org that collect stories of people that need access to science and couldn't get to it. So here, I sat by my father's hospital bed trying unsuccessfully to get access to paywalled medical research. That must be very frustrating if you're having to make a difficult medical decision in a hospital and the information is just locked away. So I think that has to be removed. But also, uh, I suppose worldwide, um, people at fancy institutions I worked at MIT and now at NUI Galway, I have access to lots of papers, but in other places in the world, you might not have access to all these uh, papers. So scientists don't even have access to all it. Okay, so um, how is this knowledge organized? Well, you have licenses that permit use and reuse. So you can have free to read, but that doesn't mean I can use it. I can't maybe use the text or the images or the, the data contained in the, in the paper. So free to read isn't everything. Um, so st standardized and open APIs enable data mining. So if you have APIs in um, uh, automated programming interface. So programmers ideally should be able to data mine papers and data sets and everything on, online, right? So there's examples that say computational systems have been developed that people can sort of interrogate these vast libraries of, uh, of scientific data and papers and automate the, that process. So basically they would go into the paper, say, and study particular cancer drugs, and especially if they're FDA approved already, that's great. And then um, maybe then uh, they can discover a new cocktail. So they can say, well, this, this uh, medicine targets that, and that medicine targets that, targets that. And they create, they could use machine learning algorithms to propose new medicine by sort of data mining the current literature. And that has been successful several times, but it is not universally allowed. So several journals have a closed API, so you can't get at it. And we're not allowed to harvest the information from these articles in an automated sense, or even in a manual sense. So um, science could progress much faster if only this were true. If there was a clear free to use and reuse license, and if the papers were discoverable, not just by humans, but by machines as well. Um, maybe people have seen this meme on, on Twitter. Um, types of scientific paper, I'll pick some. You put a camera somewhere new. What are fish even doing down there? We scanned some undergraduates. Um, so that's a joke. It just, uh, I suppose, hinted that people publish lots of things these days because they put pressure to publish. But someone fixed it on Twitter and they said, look, this is closer to reality. You can't access quite a lot of these uh, articles. Um, and people are getting access using um, quasi-legal or maybe illegal routes called Sci-Hub. And this um, URL might be dead now. They're playing whack the mall with the URL, like people keep um, closing down the website and then a new one pops up. So, so if you're interested in seeing this uh, Sci-Hub framework, 
you might have to search for the URL that's currently alive. And this lady, Alexandra Elbakian, is the inventor of the PSYOP system. And they're currently actually pushing to make this open source and to use AI to discover knowledge uh, openly. So kind of this data mining aspect. So who's using Sci-Hub? This illegal means or just bypassing the paywall and getting access anyway. Well, it turns out people thought maybe initially that it would only be at non-prestigious institutes, but it's also actually a faster way to get access. You don't have to go, oh, get access through your library and do this and do that. The step is just like download straight away. So it also makes it easier. But anyway, it seems that across the world, everywhere, just about everywhere where people are doing research, people are accessing Sci-Hub to get access to these uh, papers. Um, so just shows you that how much faster science could go if we just did this all properly. Now let's talk about open science. It seems that currently actually it's open for business. Uh, so as early, this is slightly dated, but I think it's still true. As early as 2010, Elsevier's scientific publishing arm reported profits of 724 million on just over 2, million, 2 billion in revenue. That is 36% profit, the margin. And that's higher than Apple, Google, or Amazon. Because again, they're not adding much value or they're not doing much, right? Someone at Elsevier might be upset at me saying that, but or other publishers, right? Because we typeset and write the paper. We also review the paper for free for, for other colleagues. And as editors, we often don't get paid. So they essentially host a PDF on a website and charge people for it. And um, I've actually had cases where they're, they're typesetting that they did do as a journal ruined some of my equations. So they introduced new errors and that's uh, that's possible too. That's a different story though. Here's an article, what is the price of science that summarizes some of these aspects. And there's a great movie on this that is itself free and open access online, Paywall the Movie, if you're interested in um, this whole discussion on, on, uh, on Paywall. Uh, right, so what science and organizing knowledge, let's talk about that. Well, most people cannot access academic papers. And rights are often restricted, so content cannot really be reused. And data mining is often hindered. Um, the papers often only publish is often the only published output. So really, we should be publishing all the science, which includes data, code, and designs and hardware, because otherwise it's still not reproducible, right? With just a PDF in my hands, I can't do all the science. So that's um, that's something that needs to change. So really, let's look at this definition of science again that was in Wikipedia, right? We're not really building and organizing knowledge very well, and it's not in a form that is testable. So we have to say that that definition, Wikipedia, maybe we should edit it, or we should actually edit our science scientific approach. Um, so what is the definition of open science then? Can, and can that fix it? So here's, this is funny, um, open science now, a systematic literature review for an integrated definition, and that article is paywalled. Like, that's, it's ridiculous. Uh, obviously there's much better articles that are open access that also describe open science really well. So in short, you could say it's it, open science describes the practice of carrying out scientific research in a completely transparent, transparent manner and making the results of that research available to everyone. But then you could say, wait, isn't that just science? And it should be, it should just be science. And hopefully that'll change soon. And there's an article here, when will open science simply become science that you, you could look up as well. So open science is, uh, sort of an umbrella term for lots of different aspects. It could be open data, open hardware, open source software, open access to articles. Businesses can have more transparent um, um, approaches. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's a whole uh, umbrella term for lots of different aspects. And it's, it tends to be for us a lot about open access, providing open access to your articles, open source software, open data and open hardware. And this gift showed that sharing is caring. Right. Um, so really, if you look at open science, it does seem to match this definition. It builds and organizes knowledge in a form that is testable and uh, reproducible. That's the ideal view of it. So how can we improve reproducibility in science? How could we speed up science? And how can we ensure there's global access to the knowledge without barriers? Well, choose one of these. Hide or lock away content or openly share all content. And I think it's a no brainer. We should openly share all content. And here's another one, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations. So the United Nations set out all these goals, very important ones, climate action, right? Very urgent, um, poverty, hunger, health, education, 
all these things can benefit from science pro uh, progressing in a faster, more efficient manner. The COVID pandemic is super relevant. We need to take action really fast to basically, well, combat it, right? So how can we improve quality of access to education, quality and access, access to education? Or how can we speed up health research, COVID research? Should we lock it away? Should we share it? They've done this previously with, um, with Zika, the Zika virus. Journals were like, oh, wait, quick, let's make all our Zika articles open access during this uh, issue. And then we saw that there was rapid changes uh, to target the Zika virus. With COVID as well, many journals say, oh, all our COVID stuff is now open access. So the journals know this, that health research can be sped up by making stuff open access. Similar food research. We can make uh, drought resistant or heat resistant plants if only we you know, shared the data and the, um, the knowledge faster. And climate research, like all this stuff, climate awareness, people should be able to read about the latest climate articles. We can't yet. So how, do, how can we improve general scientific literacy and decision making? Well, certainly not by hiding it away. And how can we improve trust in science? Should we say, well, the papers are hidden, so you can't really read them. Also, the peer review is secretly done by people we're not telling you about, and they either did a really thorough job or a short, you know, quick and dirty job, but, you know, we're not sharing that. How many people reviewed the article? Well, we're not sharing that. Sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes one. I've had a, pa a journal accept paper accepted, but it was one reviewer that just said, can you also cite my paper, please, effectively. And it's, it's kind of bad that these things are not uh, shared, and that it creates a distrust in science, in my opinion. It should be, it's better if that is openly done. So again, I think it's a no-brainer. You should openly share all content. That, that would be for the best of humanity. So open science is important um, because then practitioners can apply your findings. You get higher citation rates. So some of these are more to do with your career, which more visibility leads to more citations, which is good for your career, but you could go back to these uh, sustainable uh, development goals and see that they're also good for that. Um, okay, your research can influence policy if it's openly available. The public has access to your findings. Uh, this is more and more important to be compliant with grant rules, right? The SFI has a new uh, open access policy that you should check out, for instance. And taxpayers get value for money and researchers in developing countries can see your work. So you get more exposure to your work. So more difficult questions. Does open science promote innovation always? I think it very often does. There are cases perhaps when innovation needs to be protected by a patent because then the company earns back some of their investments and um, that could be so much money that it otherwise, did, like it prevents companies from wanting to invest in a particular space. It's just too expensive to set up the development if, if another company can just freely produce it straight away then, right? So there should be a different cost model. Maybe instead of patenting, the government should fund these approaches and then the companies don't have these initial investments and don't feel the need to patent. And then everybody can just say, make money of producing and selling the medicine or devices for a low cost. But there are currently, if, if patenting is the best way to earn back your investments, then I think sometimes open science could uh, appear to conflict with those interests. Uh, okay, so can patenting hinder science? I think definitely, right? Patenting prevents people from, from reproducing it or reading all about it, and companies can be very secretive about it. I currently have uh, some work, or quite a lot of my work from MIT, which I cannot share with people. Uh, so that's hindering science. Could open patents and open innovation work? I think so too. In the old days of patents, you had to show up to the patent office with a working example uh, of the thing you invented, like a hardware system. So people could go to that office and say, I would like to view this hardware setup, and they could. So in that sense, the document should describe the innovation fully and people should be able to reproduce the innovation, but not just the document. The, the figures in current patents are very cryptic and the language is very cryptic. It would be great to actually be able to reproduce it fully. And I think that could work. Uh, and maybe our views and patents and licensing should change there. Um, what are viable business models for open source and open science? So there, there are many open, there are business models that go hand in hand with being open source or open, or respecting open science principles. And I think these are relatively unknown and very quickly companies currently misunderstand open source and open science and feel that that threatens their business. And I think that needs to change too. So open for science. So let's now talk about, instead of open for business, um, how can you become an open scientist? How can you ensure 
open access to your papers. Uh, so you can publish open access for sure. You might have to pay a fee, but there's other routes to getting open access. Uh, for instance, sharing preprints. Um, you can verify all research outputs. Outputs. I'll talk about that fair uh, acronym in, in, in a little while. So you have your code, data, and hardware, or other aspects that need to be shared along with your PDF article. And you can make your for work fully reproducible. Okay, so let's talk about some confusing terminology because I said preprint there. I think the, the first picture that you have of preprint is the version before peer review. It's before printing, right? Okay, so that makes sense. That's one term for preprint. But it's also known as an author submitted version. So just so you know. Then a postprint is typically the version after peer review. That term is also bad because it's not printed yet. It's just the version after peer review. Okay, so you've implemented some changes after peer review. That version is now called a postprint officially. Uh, but it's also known as an author accepted manuscript, right? After peer review and they say, okay, we now accept it. That's your Word document or LaTeX document on your computer with the peer review comments implemented. Now it just needs to go to the publisher and be published. Uh, sometimes called the version of record. And I introduced a new acronym, annoyingly also known as preprint. So sometimes the postprint is also referred to as a preprint. It's a little bit fuzzy, so you have to be careful. SFI calls it author accepted manuscript. Okay, and this one you can often share on a preprint server. You're allowed to do that. And that gives you the green open access route. There's also ePrint, which is also the version after peer review, but might feature the journal branding, logo, and typesetting. So there could be a, an Elsevier logo on it. This one you often, with journals like El uh, with Elsevier, for instance, you cannot share these very often. Um, they have to go through the journal website. Unless it's an open access article that you paid for, then it might may be possible that you can share it. It's also known as the journal published version. And again, annoyingly, sometimes also a preprint. So preprint is, a, is the most fuzzy term. Uh, okay, so just wanted to clear those things up. Um, so some more confusing things. Preprints can be viewed as published, right? So as, as soon as I put a preprint on, say, an archive of some sort, uh, then it's online. It has a DOI, so it's actually permanent, like it's on there, it's published. And people are starting to create peer review layers. So for instance, there's the review commons that has affiliated journals, PLUS is one of them. You can post a preprint and then they organize peer review in one of these other journals. So now preprints are sort of published and then reviewed. So it's really, that's called post-publication peer review. So that is a thing. So editors do a basic check, work is published rapidly, sort of like a preprint, and several iterations of review and updated uh, versions are posted, and a final version is labeled as accepted, but the whole process is online. I invite you to have a look at F1000 uh, Research. That is a publisher that publishes open access, but has this model. As soon as you, you submit something, within two weeks, the editors agree that it looks publishable or not, and then they, you, they basically publish that work before peer review, and then uh, post-publication peer review follows. The Welcome Trust that uh, funding agency have created Welcome Open Research, which is, which is a journal based on the F1000 research framework. So it's effectively sort of a clone of it with their branding. But when you get funding from them, you should publish in that journal. ERC, the European Research Council, now have also Open Research Europe, their own journal. And again, that's sort of a clone of F1000. So major funding institutions or, or organizations are now moving to this post-publication peer review thing. They pay for all the research, so why shouldn't they own also the dis well not own, but like they, they want to enforce that definitely everything is openly available to the public. Um, so here's a list of different types of open access articles. You have preprints, postprints, author accepted manuscript. And these can be often shared with the green open access route. That means you make one of these versions uh, openly available in a repository, and that's typically not the one. Uh, that has the, uh, the journal logo on it, right? Everything before, that's green open access. Gold open access, well, you need to pay gold for this, right? You can think of it that way. You make the final version of a manuscript freely available, but you have to pay the publisher for it. But it's available immediately upon publication. Um, then another relevant one is diamond open access. So uh, the Journal of Open Source Software that I mentioned is diamond open access. So it's, uh, it's, it's fully available, but there's no author fee. It's free to publish, okay? And that, in my opinion, is the best route. That's what it should be. 
free to read, free to, free to publish, and fully open access. And you can read more here on this, uh, on this link in the bottom. OK, so people might say, but how about those predatory open access journal? Certainly the, the publisher MDPI has been associated with predatory um, activities. Um, before you consider an open access journal or any journal, you should look up some information about that journal, right? And for open access journals, there's the directory of open access journals, DOAJ, which offers a, a link of well-recognized and approved open access um, uh, journals. And this system is also recognized by major universities. For instance, at MIT, you can get your uh, open access publishing fee refunded if that journal is listed in this list. So it's an internationally recognized uh, list of, of well-respected open access journals. And it's an independent community curated online directory that indexes and provides access to high quality open access journals. And you can also ask your librarian. Typically librarians know this type of information really well. So how is it going with open, uh, open science and open access? Well, it's actually on the increase quite a bit. And I'm pleased to say that in 2017, we passed the 50% mark. So 50% of all papers published in 2017 were open access and that's going up and here you see the um, closed or paywalled uh, papers and then there's bronze hybrid and green open access being provided um, right and you can see that there's a move to gold open access but i think that's partially that is sometimes a misunderstanding people can very often use green open access which is free so we don't always have to pay the fee right so i would ask you to strongly reconsider having to pay a very high fee for open access for a journal if you can't just um, do, do the green open access route. But you mightn't always have a choice for a journal that could be just the best journal for your particular domain and you have to choose that. So why should you share preprints? So some of this now is more about your career and the visibility of the science. So it enables rapid publication, open access and citation advantage. So there's nearly always, or I think always, a citation advantage. Spark Europe, oh, the open access, um, uh, um, I forget this acronym, but they list, um, they gather studies that, that, sh that report on citations to do with preprint, and they show that um, there is, in the vast majority of cases, a very high citation advantage to having posted a preprint. So this is separate from um, whether you pay for the final version to be open access or not. Preprint just means that you you put out the one through before pre-review straight away as you submit to the journal. So you can do that with whatever journal you publish in if they allow it. And you can see that in some uh, cases, there's a huge percentage, 600% uh, increase up to a 36% increase in citation advantage if you do that. Okay, a uh, very good example is in physics, it's super well established that you publish your papers on the archive with the CHI uh, Greek letter. Um, which is a preprint server for physics. And the red curve is for people that did not submit to the archive. You could see, obviously, people start citing the work once it's available. Okay, so then you have this graph, which is a lower slope. And if you, before publication, so before zero, you release the preprint, as soon as it's there, people start reading the papers, and that goes up. And there's a sustained enhancement of readership and citations uh, for work submitted to the archive. And that trend is now being replicated in many other domains as well. So yeah, it's even if you don't care about all these uh, aspects that I mentioned, these sustainable development goals, et cetera, and why open science is important, you might want to do it just for your career. So preprints and published version should be seen as twins. So it would be annoying if you post a preprint and that starts to get citations before your version is published. So your preprint gets five citations people start reading it and citing it, and then your published version gets separate different citations. You could, you could kind of spread out your citation. As scientists, we might be slightly citation obsessed at the moment, also impact factor obsessed. Both of these obsessions are very bad. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but assuming you want citations to count, then you would prefer if the citations to your preprint add up to your final published version. And there's a way of doing that by making sure that you publish in a well-recognized um, you publish your preprint in a well-recognized preprint server that is properly indexed by all these services. So one approach, here's an example, I won't go to it, but um, this is a paper of mine in an Elsevier journal. Um, then I have posted a preprint on the engineering archive. 
And people started citing that engineering archive version. And then as soon as the published version became available, I added that DOI to the published version on my preprint listing on the engineering archive. When I did that, services like Google Scholar linked the two together. So then my five citations to my preprint added up to the published version. So uh, there now could be, for instance, 10 citations to that published version. So I started accruing uh, citations to my final work before it was actually fully um, published in the journal. And that's the way I think th that's the best way for us that that would work. It would be annoying if those citations are split up over two objects living their own life. OK, and the open access version is often offered by search engines and citations should be merged. So let's see if I can um, if I can go to that. So here, if I, you go to Google Scholar, my last name, Considerative Hyperelastic, there's several papers and you can see here because I'm logged in with the NUI framework, it, it offers the science direct version. Um, but if you hadn't, it offered a PDF to other things. So let's see which one. Oh, yeah, this one. All versions, right? So if you didn't have access it would offer the engineering archive version here. And um, cited by eight, some of these citations are to the preprint and some of them are to the final published version. And these are all collected together. And you can see other archives for other people's articles are on other archives. This is that physics archive. This is um, a funding, uh, a funded um, project archive. And um, yeah, or sometimes a university repository. But I think it's best to do a discipline repository, in my personal opinion. Uh, am I the right page here? Yeah, uh, a discipline repository like engineering or biology, the bioarchive, because then you have a wider readership than a university repository. All right, so can we trust preprints or are they non peer reviewed rubbish, as people have called them? Actually, you should remember that before the 70s, old papers in the Lancet and Nature were not peer reviewed and people are still citing those works as, as highly robust, right? So um, many preprints are very robust pieces of science. People are not putting uh, rubbish papers out or the majority is just actual stuff that gets published in the end. So 70%, more than 70% eventually gets published. And there's many studies that have, have shown the same conclusion. Preprints should be considered valid scientific contributions that are comparable to the peer-reviewed uh, literature. And let me see if I can uh, show the SFI policy on preprint. This is new and I haven't uh, fully read it before today. So um, um, SFI also oops, recognizes it. Sorry, I'm having trouble having a medium zoom level. Oh, come on. Um, okay, it says to facilitate, to facilitate prompt dissemination of research findings, SFI encourages uh, researchers to deposit uh, preprints ahead of publication. So SFI recognizes that this is an important route as well. And they want you to put it in a, a proper preprint repository with the digital object identifier. Okay, so uh, consider that uh, as well. So, um, and these, I'm citing the slightly older ones potentially, I think. Yes, so uh, do have a look at the most recent open access policies for SFI. But in principle, the funding agency does recommend it. And um, another one, does depositing a preprint make my publication compliant with the open access policy? This is something that I want to verify, so maybe check that as well. Um, but I think the author accepted manuscript after peer review must be made openly available. So the preprint before peer review does not um, comply with that open access policy. But if you do the one after peer review and publish that on a preprint server, then that would cover the green open access uh, or the open access requirement for SFI. Um, but they should be clearer on that and I've, I will ask them to clarify that. So how do you share preprints? So um, if you have currently publications that you want to make open access and they, they're not yet, you could make a list and check it twice. So the recommended approach is to populate your ORCID profile. So ORCID is this nice um, researcher ID uh, profile that you can make and it can list absolutely all of your research outputs. Once you have everything there, you could check the, the, the rights for a particular journal. So let's have a look at this. Um, this um, how do you figure out your rights? There's this nice, can I get to that? Uh, I want to go to that. Yeah, Sherpa Romeo, funny name, but that's a way to check out your rights. So let's see if I can zoom in here. Yeah, yeah. So let's say Journal of 
biomechanics. That's an LCD journal, biomechanics. If you're confused about these things, you can also check with your librarian. So here they talk about the journal and then the publisher options. So there's different routes to open access here. You can share the published version. Well, you, you might have to pay for it, right? Uh, so then you can go accepted version, pathway A, pathway B. So um, you can uh, share that on your author homepage. Well, that's actually not recommended. There's a 20 month embargo currently on sharing the author accepted manuscripts, which would satisfy the SFI uh, conditions, for instance. And then you can put it on a subject or institutional repository. For instance, the engineering archive uh, would work. So there's a 12 month embargo. You can only do it after 12 months. But the submitted version, you can put anywhere. Actually, you own that, right? That's your document, you wrote it. Sometimes you have to switch to a different journal, right? They reject it, you go to a different one. The journal you submitted to does not instantly own your stuff. The submitted version can always be shared, it's yours. So um, yeah, so this journal unfortunately has an embargo, period. So Sherpa Romeo allows you to figure out the rights that you have for a particular journal to share your content or not. So that's, you make a list and then for each you could check your rights and um, um, once you know it, you can um, pick a preprint repository like the engineering archive or different one. There's a nice list of lots of different um, discipline specific repositories provided here. And you upload to the repository and then you advertise in social media and you update the version on the repository after peer review. So if works are accepted, very often on these proper repositories, you can add the accepted uh, paper link as well, and that'll make the services like Google Scholar link the two together, the journal version and your preprint that is on the repository. So that's the last step, and that's, that's what you need to do. So other things, how can you become an open scientist? So we talked about uh, preprinting and sharing open access. You could verify your research outputs. What does that mean? They should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So um, the, you can dump your data out there, but if people have no idea how to interrogate your data, there's no guides to say, this is data for motion analysis of the human body. Uh, the, you know, the first column offers motion of the arm, the second column motion of the leg. If that information isn't there, it's just gibberish. And it's not, it's findable and accessible, but nobody can interrogate that data, right? And it should be reusable such that if you say, okay, I created some lovely plots of the motion of the arm, can I publish these? And they say, if there's a license that says, no, we own everything, then it's not really fair, right? This reusable aspect, that's where the license kicks in. It, the license should say, you're allowed to do this, this, and this, and this, okay? And there's a nice video on that on YouTube too. Okay, this is very much the same thing, so I'll skip that. Um, so no license, the default is very often copyrighted. So some people put say, my code is available here, but if you don't have a license, it's still copyrighted. I'm not allowed to just copy it and change it and work my own code with it. Like that's not allowed. So you need to add a license, whether you like it or not, you have to do a bit of reading. For text, data, and images, so let's call that, I typically call that content, right? Creative Commons licenses are best, and only for that type of content, right? Creative Commons licenses. You see these often on articles that you publish. Data, there's some open data commons uh, licenses that you can uh, read about. For software, the best licenses are listed and approved by the Open Source Initiative. And for hardware, the Open Hardware Association has uh, licenses listed. Um, and that's a new, so the data and hardware licenses are a relatively new development the software licenses are very well established. So there's two main types of licenses. Um, I'm most familiar with the software ones, so I'll talk about those. There's ones that say that are permissive and ones that are copyleft. So permissive, you could say, ah, whatever, you know, do what you want, take it. Um, that includes, let's, uh, you, a company could steal your code. You could, steal is a bad word. They could take your code and then lock it away patent that technology uh, or build a product on it and, or advance that software, make it like a super commercial version of that software and then not share anything with you, not required to share your code. And you might see your code be a super successful commercial product and you get nothing, um, right? So that can be disappointing. Uh, not that you need money, but I'm just saying that they can lock it away. They, they have no commitments to the open source. There's no promise to open source, and that's the permissive licenses. 
So businesses often like it if you've chosen such a license because then they can package it and mix it with their product and it won't hurt them. Whereas the copy left one is viral. That's the negative way of saying it. It's sort of a Midas touch. Everything it touches should become an open source as well. So as soon as you use it, your libraries or your advancements or changes that you make have to be released open source as well. So this is open source all the way and that's why there's a unicorn pulling a rainbow there because it's sort of that sort of more hippie-ish open, everything's open source man type of license. And there's different reasons to implement um, these different licenses, but you should think carefully about them, what you want to happen with your project afterwards. Okay, and there's equivalent uh, content licenses, the CC BY licenses might say, sure, use it, but then, you know, uh, attribute me and then cite me kind of, and um, uh, your work should follow my license as well. That's the content license. All right, so uh, here's an example of uh, something that uh, I like the way I, I did this. This is now on GitHub 3D NIV. This is a ventilator system. So here uh, we built for COVID uh, a splitter for a ventilator system to basically double the capacity of a ventilator during the COVID pandemic. We, we put all the, the software that you need here with the software license on GitHub. We put the hardware and the design source files here on GitHub. Uh, all the drawings, schematics and instructions on how to build it are openly available there so people can replicate it. So now um, that's how I did that. We added licenses for everything, added documentation, created an archive on a service called Zenodo so that it's sort of packaged for long-term storage because I could delete the GitHub repository or morph it into something different and then people have lost it, right? But the Zenodo archive kind of keeps it forever. And then paper submitted to the Journal of Open Hardware. So we also published a paper and the reviewers during review had full access to everything. So they could say, oh yes, everything is reproducible as part of the review process. And following acceptance, we updated the readme on the GitHub repository to show the archive link as well as how to cite the work in the paper. Okay, so this is one way that you could could, could work and maybe the hardware part can be replaced by a software part or data thing, depending on what you work on. Um, I also recently published this paper on the right and you could, as, as I'm scrolling there, you could see graphs being produced. Well, on the left is the open source software for that article that I shared as well and all the graphs are reproduced uh, with the software and documentation that I share. So readers of my paper instantly can move on and make the science better and use it. And that is an example of how to do that. So how do you become an open scientist? Um, make your work fully reproducible. And uh, yeah, publish your works open access. Upload preprints to ensure that your papers are accessible to everyone. And share open data, open source code, and open hardware. And these are some repositories. Zenodo is a great one, uh, which is hosted by CERN and maintained by CERN in Switzerland. Figshare is another one. Um, where people are hosting data sets. The Center for Open Science um, is the backbone for many uh, archives, like the engineering archive, but you can also host other project content there and GitHub, of course. All right, so but that's the end of my presentation. I think I'm at 45 minutes roughly. So if there's any questions, um, let me know, but thanks a lot for, for listening today.